uh, yeah, there were uh, a number of code level changes. Um, one of the important ones was uh, that we raised the voltage level up to 1,000 volts from 600 volts. Um, so this was done largely because of the higher voltages that were seen on uh, PV and wind systems. And so now the breakpoint is over 1,000 volts or 1,000 volts or under. Um, and if these changes were made throughout the code. It, not everything uh, was changed. So, uh, for instance, in Article 110 on the, um, the requirements for uh, electrical installations, um, Part 2 was um, uh, 600 volts. Is, they left that at um, 600 volts or less. And then Part 3 is 600 volts or over 600 volts. So, um, by and large, the voltage levels have been changed, not uniformly, though, or not completely. Uh, another change that's going to make a difference is uh, about field applied hazard warnings. Um, so, uh, basically, what they did, there were a number of sections throughout the code where it required hazard warnings. And so instead of repeating what the sign looked like and what the warning had to look like, uh, they put a new section in at 110.21b and then referred back to that section throughout the code. So it's just a more efficient way to do it and it's, it's a way to standardize the sign. So um, one of the things they said was that we had to use effective uh, a language and effective colors and effective symbols. So, uh, like on the sign there uh, on the cage, it says "danger, high voltage, keep out." And and so when we have a warning sign, basically we want to uh, give a warning, danger. Uh, we want to say uh, what the danger is. In this case, it's high voltage, and then we want to give people some direction of, of what they need to do. So, keep out. Um, and colors are standardized usually when we have a danger sign, it's red, or a warning sign, it's, it's yellow. Um, I mean, it's uh, a warning sign, it's orange, and then caution is yellow. So um, the signs need to be uh, fixed or uh, put on the equipment itself. They can't be next to it or adjacent to it. Uh, and the signs have to be suitable for the environment. So. Uh, if it's an outdoor location, then uh, the sign needs to be suitable for an outdoor location. There were uh, a number of new articles in the code, and one of them was 393, uh, and that's low voltage suspended ceiling power distribution. Uh, and I think this is an exciting technology, and it's uh, especially since we're seeing so many more LED lights, and of course LED lighting is low voltage lighting, and in the past, we've run individual uh, 120 or 277 volt circuits to strings of light fixtures and then uh, took a power supply and converted that to low voltage. Well, the way this works is that we run a single branch circuit or a feeder to a class 2 power supply and that class 2 power supply which operates at 30 volts AC or 60 volts DC uh, feeds a bus. and um, the bus basically is uh, is installed, right, okay, I've got an arrow. So this right here, that's the bus, the low voltage bus that's installed on a standard piece of, uh, uh, you know, lighting support grid. And so we can power up the grid uh, by, from the power supply, we can configure the grid in any way we want. So if, for instance, we, we've got the lighting set up for a conference room and we wanted to change it to a classroom, that really would be just a matter of, of changing where the, um, the power grid was. And then to supply the fixtures or the luminaires, all we need to do is, is clip on. So, you know, this would be a clip that would connect to the, the low voltage bus and then that would go out and, and feed a luminaire. So, very easy um, to change a setup and uh, of course it's much safer because it's low voltage so when we're doing maintenance on those on that equipment we don't have to worry about shock hazards. So yeah Jeff did you have some on that? Yeah um, and it's not really a question so much as it's just something to think about. Um, for jurisdictions that don't adopt the 2014 code right away I'm just wondering how 
they will deal with somebody who wants to install a low voltage, a low volt uh, suspended ceiling system. I mean, if Article 393 is in the 2014 code, and if somebody doesn't necessarily adopt it right away, but the technology is there, I'm kind of curious. And like I said, it's not really a question. I think it's just something to consider because. Will the jurisdictions be forced to look into the 2014 requirements? Will they simply use the special permission allowance in 90.4 to accept methods that, that um, aren't necessarily mentioned in the code as long as they're safe? I mean, 393 has specific definitions, uses permitted, uses not permitted, listing requirements, provisions for disconnection, as well as overcurrent protection. And so for jurisdictions that might not necessarily adopt the 2014 code for even up to a year or more, I think it's just something to consider um, if for those people that actually work for a jurisdiction, what you are going to do. Are you going to try to look into 2014 code book even though you, you're not adopting it or are you just, you know, what are you going to do? I just more wanted to put that out there as something to think about. Okay. All right. Um, one of the other uh, new articles was uh, 646 on modular data centers. And uh, basically, these can be shipped on site in a standard shipping container uh, to, you know, say there was an emergency, a hurricane, or a tornado, or something, and all the IT infrastructure got knocked out. You can basically deliver one of these modular data centers, and it has everything in it that you would need to, um, you know, to work, say, a 911 center or uh, fire department, police. Um, it has it. It would come equipped with air conditioning and uh, all the, of course, the power distribution. Uh, there'd be adequate workspace uh, in the modular data center and exit signs and and pretty much everything that you needed, not only to supply IT power, uh, but also provide a safe work environment for the people in there. Okay, another one was uh, 728 on uh, fire resistive cable systems. And up until we had this new article, pretty much all that we had to rely on for um, installation requirements was from the listing agencies or from the manufacturer's instructions. So um, now that we've got a new article in there, uh, we've got guidelines when we're installing fire resistive cabling systems for, uh, you know, mounting, supporting, uh, splicing, marking, things like that. So up until this article, uh, we didn't really have those requirements uh, except for in the manufacturer's instructions. And David, I also have something to, to add there as well. Um, similar to along the lines of my previous question about the jurisdictions and how things will be enforced, the, the beauty of this one, uh, Article 728, is that um, even if jurisdictions don't necessarily adopt the 2014 code, at least the provisions are there, as well as the requirements in Article 728 um, that cables be listed or cables be marked a certain way. I mean, if you consider um, fire pumps, Section 695.6 .6 in the code allows fire pump supply conductors to be a listed electrical circuit with at least a two-hour rating, and prior to the addition of Article 728 coming along, the cable information, like you said, was found really only in the product listing. And so now we have 728.120, which requires cables and conductors to be marked, uh, FRR, which stands for Fire Resistive Rating, along with the number of hours that the cable's rated for. Um, so even if jurisdictions don't necessarily adopt Article 728, at least we'll see the appropriate marking on the cables, which will help us as we try to determine during inspection if somebody's met the proper criteria for having a two-hour listed fire protective system, cable system for fire pumps and other installations that require it. Okay. Um, another new article was 750 on energy management systems. and. I think many of us are familiar with energy management systems and and basically how they can how you can use a system like this to implement a local energy code uh, and to shave either the peak power or to reduce the total power consumption uh, of a building. Um, in Article 220, uh, the code says that that if you have an energy management system in place, that you can use the set points for. Um, to, to determine the, the lighting load on the building. So rather than have to base it on square footage, 
you can use what the what the limits are that uh, that the energy management system sets. So um, that's going to allow us to to make more realistic calculations about what the actual energy load of a building is going to be. I mean, one other thing about energy management systems, though, there is some information in Article 750 that says that uh, the system can't override uh, other systems like the emergency system or legally required standby systems or elevators or uh, things like that. Thank, thanks, David. Um, I see a question here from Leonard regarding the modular data centers. Um, this is for the panel. Are Separation requirement, class one to class two, class three still applicable? Um, he said that they had one show up with missed systems in the same cable tray. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they would be, that, that it would be important that we separate those uh, different types of conductors. Um, you know, I mean, I would assume that that would have been done in the, by the manufacturer of the, of the modular data centers, but it certainly would I would think it would be required, yeah. And again, with anything, uh, <laughs> any particular question does require a little bit of looking things up in the code. So as we go along here, if um, we find out more information about a particular question, we'll just interject and uh, add more information because we do have three um, knowledgeable people in the code here. So thanks for the question. Now, for the next section on GFCI protection and um, dedicated equipment space, let me turn it over to Don Hersey. Um, Don? Okay, dedicated equip electrical space was first introduced in the 1999 National Electrical Code, but it was for indoor installations only of switchboards, panel boards, and motor control centers. Now, 11026E includes dedicated electrical equipment space for outdoor installations of switchboard, in this code cycle it adds switch gear, panel boards, and motor control centers. The dedicated equipment space is the space equal to the width and depth of the equipment and extends from the grade to a height of six feet above the equipment. No piping or other equipment that's foreign to the electrical installation shall be installed in that zone. So this reserved space is also important for outdoor installations as well. Now once we get above that six foot zone, foreign systems are permitted to be in those spaces above six feet, but protection is required. Now, Don, if I could jump in here for a second, one of the one of the questions we get a lot from people when they hear about this is, you know, hey, is this about dedicated equipment space or dedicated workspace or, or both? This, is, this section here is pertaining uh, strictly to dedicated equipment space. And, and the reason it's dedicated, it's dedicated for the, uh, the electrician to install his wiring methods to, uh, to get into the switchboard, panel board, switchgear, or motor control center. And even for down the road, they need adequate space to get into these uh, pieces of equipment and that's why it's just these four particular pieces of equipment because, like, for example, if we had an automatic transfer switch for a generator installation, then once those uh, wiring methods are in place, you wouldn't be going back later and installing additional wiring methods. Okay, and here we have uh, on the left, uh, looks like installation of combination uh, meter-based panel board. And uh, that is a panel board, so dedicated equipment space is required from the bottom of that enclosure to the grade, whatever distance that may be. And then above the top of that to a height of six feet. So no foreign piping, uh, roof downspouts, or uh, any other type of piping could be installed in that location. Now to the left of that, you will see another meter base and a disconnect Below that, it appears to be a, uh, another service disconnect for a photovoltaic system, and over further to the left, we see an inverter. Those two types of equipment are not required to have that dedicated space as the uh, panel board is required. Uh, your photo at the bottom in the middle shows a um, 
like a typical 200 amp residential meter base. Uh, there again, no dedicated equipment space is required for that. Uh, your photo on the right showing the uh, outside air conditioned unit. And it looks like a little disconnecting means that, which is required by the code, obviously. But there again, no dedicated equipment space would be required for that. Working space, yes, but dedicated equipment space, no. Okay, 210.8A7, GFCI protection for personnel. This section is that requires GFCI protection for all 125 volt, 15 and 20 ampere rated receptacles that are installed within six feet of a sink. The 2014 now includes GFCI protection for kitchen receptacles installed within six feet of, of a dwelling. Previous code cycle excluded kitchens, residential kitchens, but now it does include kitchens. For example, if I have a wall receptacle to serve a refrigerator, and that refrigerator, is, that refrigerator receptacle is located within six feet of the kitchen sink, then yes, GFCI protection will now be required for that refrigerator receptacle. Uh, another example of some equipment you may have in the kitchen within six feet of a kitchen sink is a receptacle for garbage disposal. Uh, if it have a garbage disposal, obviously something located under the kitchen sink and measuring from that receptacle around up to the top of that edge of that sink, if it's within six feet, GFCI protection will be required. Now the question will be asked, uh, how do we take that measurement? Well, we would just take a flexible measuring tape or you could take a string or whatever and uh, touch the receptacle GFCI receptacle, receptacle outlet, and go up to the uh, edge of the kitchen sink and that measurement is six feet or less, then GFCI protection would be required. Even though that receptacle is behind cabinet doors, if it's within six feet of that sink. Another example, and you'll notice there the uh, microwave range hood above the kitchen stove, uh, that receptacle up there, and it would be one there because that is a cord and plug piece of equipment. And if that measurement from that receptacle down to the edge of that uh, sink there, that kitchen island, is six feet or less would require GFCI protection. Of course, all your kitchen receptacles that are serving countertop space are required to be GF GFCI protected anyway. Uh, one more example there in that island, that receptacle there on that uh, wall space down below that kitchen countertop, measuring from that receptacle around up to the, yes, around up to the edge of that kitchen sink, then if that's within six feet, and it appears to me that it is, then GFCI is required, protection is required, even though that receptacle is not there to serve the kitchen island countertop. Okay, we're still talking about GFCI protection of branch circuits 210.8D. Well, it looks like we're going to have to purchase another GFCI device for uh, kitchens, uh, and there'll be some more talked about a little later. Uh, dishwashers installed in dwelling unit kitchens will now have to be GFCI protected. This protection is required for all dishwasher outlets, cord and plug connected, and hardwired. Uh, studies have shown electronically controlled dishwashers can experience end-of-life failures that can result in increased shock, risk of shock. The GFCI protection device should be installed in a readily accessible location for testing purposes. And of course, we know readily accessible means it can be reached quickly without resorting to portable ladders or the use of a tool. So regardless whether the uh, location of the receptacle for the dishwasher, it needs to be GFCI protected. And a better location, if you want to use a GFCI receptacle device, I think it would be a better installation to show have that receptacle under the kitchen sink and cord and plug connected there and then that would be a good location to install it so we can test and reset those monthly according to the manufacturer's installation instructions. Of course another option would be a standard receptacle and then put a GFCI circuit breaker back at the panel board. Now, Don, I, I know it's a simple thing, but uh, how often are we supposed to test these things? Monthly. We should, and that's the reason the code changed back. Uh, 
First, I, know, I know I test mine monthly. Yes, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you do, but uh, kind of like the smoke alarms, we're supposed to test them. This readily accessible for GFCI protection first was introduced in the National Electrical Code when it's a device. Now, I'm not talking about circuit breakers because we know that uh, 240 has always required that to be readily accessible to uh, 240.24. But the device itself being readily accessible was first introduced in the 2008 code 680.71 for hydro massage bath tests because they were being located in that area that a lot of homeowners didn't really know that uh, how easy it was to get to it. So the code changed in 2008, started requiring the GFCI device to be readily accessible for the hydro massage test. Then it was extended in 2011, those that are listed in Article 210.8. A, B, or C, the GFCI device has to be readily accessible. And we got a question here from Leonard. Uh, what if the dishwasher is hardwired? That's a good question, but 210.8D tells us that GFCI protection is required for dishwashers installed in the kitchen. It doesn't even give us a voltage or amperage rating. And it does not mention whether it's receptacle or hardwired. So bottom line is we've got to provide GFCI protection for this dishwasher regardless of how it's connected. Great, Don. Thanks for that overview of uh, GFCI protection. Uh, Jeff, I think Jeff had a question, I mean, an answer to Leonard's question about modular data centers. So before he goes into AFCI protection, let me turn over to Jeff to get that question on uh, wire class and modular data centers. Okay, so the question came from Leonard regarding a modular data center. Are separation requirements, class one, class two, class three, circuit conductors still applicable? Um, says here they had one show up with a missed system in the same cable tray. I'm not sure exactly about that, but what I'm reading <clears throat> in uh, 646, if you go to 646. 3L, as in Larry. Um, and you look, unless modified elsewhere in, the, in this article, wiring methods and materials for power distribution shall comply with Chapter 3. Wiring shall be suitable for its use um, and insulation and shall be listed and labeled. And then there's an exception. This requirement shall not necessarily apply to wiring that's part of listed, listed and labeled equipment. So depending on how the modular data center comes out, if the modular data center comes out as a whole and the whole thing is listed as a modular data center, then I would assume that everything in it was looked at as part of the listing of the equipment other than your physical connections to the modular data center. Um, if you look closer at 646.3L uh, and you go down to subsection Four, installation of wiring for remote control signaling and power limited circuits shall comply with part three of article 725. So you go over to 725.121, which is part, which where part three begins in article 725. Scroll over a few pages, get over to 725.139 um, E, for example, class two or class three cables with other circuit cables. And it simply just tells you that jacketed cables of class two or class three circuits shall be permitted in the same enclosure, cable tray, raceway, or uh, cable routing assembly with jacketed cables of any of the following. And I know they're referring to jacketed cables here, but it does give you five different items. Um, you know, and it talks about power limited fire alarm systems in compliance with parts one and three of article 760. So really you just need to go through it and see where it applies. But in general, I, I think that the separation requirements would be something that would have to be field verified by the inspector if the modular data center was not listed as a whole. Great, thanks. And I, <clears throat> I bet we're going to have some good discussion along the way here. Uh, keep those questions coming. We're working on them in the background, and we'll revisit them here. Uh, right now, uh, I think Jeff is going to go through the 2014 changes to AFCI protection which is a hot topic and something I know we're all interested in. So without further ado, Jeff Simpson, AFCI Protection. AFCI Protection, uh, Section 210.12 here. We've got some new requirements. We're seeing a few different things going on in the beginning of Section 210.12 here. We have a new requirement that simply tells us that the device protecting or providing the AFCI protection must be located in a readily accessible location. Simple enough. Um, look at your de definitions in Article 100 of accessible locations. 
uh, your AFCI um, protection has to be readily accessible for the purpose of testing and what have you. Um, we also have two additional areas within a dwelling that require AFCI protection, kitchens and laundry rooms. So that's going to be interesting as we transition to the, these new requirements. Technically, the questions are going to arise, how can we provide both GFCI as well as AFCI protection, uh, protection for the kitchen and laundry receptacles? The answer to that is until the manufacturers produce a circuit breaker that provides AFCI as well as GFCI protection, we're most likely going to see an AFCI breaker at the electric panel, which provides a, uh, protection to the GFCI type receptacle in the kitchen or laundry room. Uh, manufacturers tell us that there's really no issues with these devices being wired in series and, and they will not have any adverse effects. They'll work together to eliminate uh, the ground fault issues or the parallel or series arcing fault issues. So where I think the installer or the inspector will end up in a tricky situation is going to be the laundry room. Um, now that section 210.8 requires GFCI protection for all 125 volt receptacles installed in the laundry room, regardless of if there's a sink within six feet or not, in order to end up with both AFCI protection and GFCI protection and for all devices to be readily accessible, the laundry room GFCI type receptacle will need to be located to where it's accessible, either high enough above the clothes washer so that the uh, reset buttons are accessible or possibly on an adjacent wall, maybe install a GFCI receptacle on a wall prior to running another cable from there over to the point where your washing machine is. A lot of these washing machines come in nowadays on a stand. You can get the optional stand that puts the thing another foot and a half off the ground. And in some cases, your receptacle for your washing machine will be ren rendered inaccessible and you're going to have to be faced with putting a GFCI receptacle elsewhere until these manufacturers come up with a device that's all-encompassing that does everything. So it's going to take some thought on the part of the inspector who has to make a judgment call at the final inspection, sometimes without the appliances present. He'll have to consider, okay, what's going to happen here once they put the washing machine in. At the time, it's readily accessible if there's no washing machine there at final, but after I leave, what's going to happen? Now, now Jeff, I was on the phone with a guy yesterday. That's not fair. It was the other day. But he was just saying, tell to me straight, will the receptacle outlet for a washing machine in the laundry and a refrigerator in the kitchen have to be AFCI protected? Yes, no? Absolutely. Um, everything in the kitchen, everything in the laundry. It's not going to be uh, relative to whether or not a sink is present. So generally in the past, if you had a receptacle within six feet of the sink, that's, that's where your trigger was. Um, oh, I'm sorry, for GFCI. But AFCI, yes. AFCI and GFCI, uh, both kitchen and laundry, when you're dealing with 125-volt single-phase uh, 15 to 20-amp receptacles. Great. Now, at the beginning, I said we'd have uh, a couple of polls along the way. Um, since AFCI protection is extremely applicable, let's take a quick look real quick on <clears throat> get, a, get a little question here to the crowd. Which area of a house does not require AFCI protection? Um, if you want to make your choice there, click the button on your screen, and uh, we'll see what Jeff has to say about it. Let some other folks here get their answers in. All right, so it looks like uh, we're looking at uh, people are thinking the closet or the bathroom. You want to address those two locations, Jeff? Well, depending on where a closet's located, um, if a closet was located in a bathroom, um, no. Um, anything in the bathroom does not require the AFCI protection. Bathrooms, um, garages, uh, outdoor, um, the, your attic for your HVAC equipment and your receptacle required within 25 feet, all of those locations will not require the AFCI protection. Okay, so the answer to this particular question, bathroom is an area of the house that does not require AFCI protection. So thanks for your participation there. Moving on. Okay, 210.12a, the actual AFCI protection itself. We have a total of six methods 
that are considered acceptable for providing AFCI protection. Three are new, the other three were existing with no significant changes other than the style in which they were written. The three new options are geared towards not requiring a metal raceway or a metal cable between the panel board and the first outlet. Um, the previous options that we had before, generally if you're not putting a combination type AFCI at the panel board ahead of the branch circuit, then most likely you're choosing to use a rigid metal conduit or a metal cable assembly or encase a raceway in two inches of concrete. But these new requirements are geared towards being able to utilize an existing cable that's non-metallic. And so what we have in 210.12A2, that's new, and it says we can simply install a listed branch slash feeder type AFCI at the panel board along with a listed outlet branch circuit type, or OBC is what you'll hear a lot, type AFCI installed at the first outlet box on the branch circuit. And then we have to mark that box to indicate that it's the first outlet of the circuit. So the question is, technically, what is a listed branch slash feeder type AFCI? That, that type of question, I've been asked that before. And if you look back in the previous code requirements back in 2002, 2005, before we were required to switch to the combination type arc fault uh, breaker, effective January 1 of 2008, the previous requirements just simply required a listed branch slash feeder type AFCI, the type that wasn't necessarily geared towards protecting um, both series and parallel arcing faults. So that, I think, will be an easier option. We know those products are available. We saw them in 2002. We saw them in 2005 before we switched to the combination type. So those products are available. That's a simple solution in my book to be able to install one of those um, and then go ahead and put in the outlet type branch circuit at the first junction box. Uh, 210.12A3 is new and it says we can install a listed supplemental arc protection circuit breaker at the panel board along with a listed outlet branch circuit type AFCI installed at the first outlet box on the branch circuit, but there's three conditions. Number one, wiring from the overcurrent device to the outlet type AFCI must be continuous. Number two, the length of the wiring from the overcurrent device to the first outlet cannot exceed 50 feet for a 14 gauge conductor or 70 feet for a 12 gauge conductor. I know these measurements were part of the testing that was done to establish that we can even use these options. And number three, the first outlet box in the branch circuit must be marked to indicate that it's the first outlet of the circuit. Um, but going back to the general rule where it says install a listed supplemental arc protection circuit breaker at the panel board, I don't know what that's going to look like until I see one. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting the manufacturers to start producing these products so that we can see what they're going to look like or how they're going to be marked or what they're going to be listed as. At the moment, we don't know. 210.12A4 is new. It says we can install a listed outlet branch circuit type AFCI at the first outlet on the branch circuit along with the listed overcurrent device protecting the circuit but you have to meet four conditions. Number one, similar to the previous rule, the wiring from the overcurrent device to the outlet type AFCI must be continuous. Number two, the length of the wiring from the overcurrent device to the first outlet cannot exceed 50 feet for a 14 gauge conductor or 70 feet for a 12 gauge conductor. Number three, the first outlet box in the branch circuit must be marked to indicate that it's the first outlet on the circuit. And the last one, which will be the kicker, is the combination of the circuit breaker or branch circuit overcurrent device and the outlet branch circuit type AFCI shall be identified as meeting the requirements for a system combination type AFCI and shall be listed as such. I, once again, I don't know what that's going to look like until I see it. Um, but if you look at the rule where it says install a listed outlet branch circuit type AFCI at the first outlet on the branch circuit along with a listed overcurrent device. It doesn't say a listed AFCI overcurrent device, it just says a listed overcurrent device. I mean as we all know most overcurrent devices are listed. Um, but these two will have to meet the criteria for being a, a listed selected combination that is 
meant to be able to eliminate the series in parallel arcing faults. And like I said, I, until I see them, I don't know what they're going to look like. All right, thanks, Jeff. That's a quick overview of changes that's coming to uh, AFCI protection. Uh, next, we're going to move on to sizing conductors and changes that have that are going to be in the 2014 NEC regarding conductors and opacity sizing. So let's send it over to David. David? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, this section is 21019A1, and um, I think it's important. It was put as a proposal into the code by a friend of mine, Charles R. Miller of uh, Lighthouse Electric, and it was accepted by the code panels, and basically what it says is that when we're um, when we have a continuous load uh, and we have the conditions of use, what the code calls the conditions of use, which are either uh, more than three current carrying conductors in conduit or an elevated temperature uh, above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, then the question, the question that this addresses is what do we do if we have both a continuous load and uh, conditions of use? And in the past it was, it was confusing. So, um, what they've done is they've clarified it uh, in the 2014 code, and, and basically what they say is that you take the larger of either continuous load or uh, more than three current conductors in conduit or an elevated ambient. So uh, you don't take all three, or if you have uh, more than three current carrying conductors and you have a continuous load, you don't have to derate or you don't have to adjust the size of the conductor that you need uh, for both of those conditions. So, you know, in, in this graphic here, basically what we're trying to show is that we've, you know, on one side of the scale is the ambient temperature and more than three current carrying conductors. And if we have both of those, then we have to apply both of them. We've got a uh, get a, a conductor that's large enough to account for both the ambient temperature and more than three current carrying conductors. But if we have one or both of those and a continuous load, then we don't have to combine them. We just like in the scale you compare. So you would compare what size you con conductor you would need to supply the continuous load. You do that and then you come over here and you say, well, what size conductor do I need to satisfy the conditions of use? And then you take the larger of the two. So um, I think that's that's a very good clarification. Um, I mean, just as an example, um, you know, if we had um, a, uh, or what size THWN conductor is required to supply 100 amp continuous load when there are seven current carrying conductors in conduit. So, in this example, we've got a continuous load and we have more than three current carrying conductors and conduits. So in 2011, I think a lot of people would have um, adjusted the wire, got a larger wire size that would uh, be big enough for the 100 amp continuous load and seven current carrying conductors. And in 2014, we don't have to do that. So we do step one, we, we figure for continuous load and multiply the load by 125 gives us 125 amps and, <coughs> and we need a number one THWN. <clears throat> then the uh, second step would be we would compare uh, the value that we would get if we uh, had seven current carrying conductors and conduits. So when we do it for continuous load, we get 125 amps. When we, when we adjust for more than three current carrying conductors, we get 143 amps. So that require what we have to do is we have to choose the larger conductor that will uh, supply or satisfy every, each one of those loads, but we don't add them together. Um, so, you know, we just select the larger of the two conductors. And I'm going to back up here and just on, you know, so if we had, had done it the old way or had done it incorrectly, then um, it may be that we would have taken this 143 amps and multiplied it by 125%. And if we did that, we'd get 178.75 amps. So that would be larger than what we need now. And of course, if we have 
larger conductors than we need, larger everything, larger uh, conduit, um, larger fittings, all of that that would add to the cost of the of the installation. So now, uh, if we have we figure for continuous load on the one hand, keep that number, and then we do another calculation for more than three conductors or an elevated ambient temperature, uh, and then we compare which one is bigger. Hey, David. Um, one more thing about that as well is. Uh, there's similar requirements in uh, section 215.2 for feeders. Right. Uh, feeders. Mm -hmm. yeah, and those are new. Uh, same thing. And then we have uh, existing requirements that were actually added in 2011 that pretty much mimic what we're seeing here. And that's actually in uh, section 690.8 for sizing your photovoltaic uh, source circuits and what have you and overcurrent protection and conductors. Right. And so that that was not necessarily new this year in 690, but it was new last code cycle. Yeah, and and with these with this requirement in for for branch circuits and feeders, this is going to apply generally basically to any type of wiring that that would use a branch circuit or a feeder. Oh, thanks for that already, David. Uh, let's let's go to Jeff now, who's got a couple of changes, important changes to. 210.52. Okay, so uh, let's advance the slide. And section 210.52G um, now requires a receptacle for each car space in an attached or a detached dwelling unit garage uh, with electric power. Also, what's important about it is the branch circuit serving the garage receptacles cannot supply outlets outside of the garage. So possible misinterpretations might arise such as, well, what's considered outside the garage? Um, what about the garage coach lights on each side of the garage uh, roll-up door? Are those, I mean, they're on the garage. Are they, technically they're outside of the garage, but the wiring passes through the garage. Um, what if I have uh, motorcycles? I mean, we have this requirement that uh, each car space has to have its own receptacle. Um, what if I have motorcycles? What if I have a two-car garage but I keep motorcycles? I mean, there's going to be. The, I mean, I know the answer to some of these questions, but I think some of them are going to arise. We're always going to have some gray areas as we try to work through a new uh, code edition. Um, somebody might ask, well, what about a carport? Um, I think we have an image coming up. That, uh, yeah. that, that we could probably pull up and have a look at. I mean, in this image that you see on the screen, you've clearly got um, a single car garage on the right and on the left. You've got a two car garage in the center. You've got a carport to the far right and a carport to the far left. The electrical code does not really specify what is considered a carport. Uh, it does have a definition in Article 100 of a garage, but they don't really talk about the number of walls in order to, for it to be considered a carport. But um, other codes do. The International Residential Code, for example, specifies that uh, carports that are not open on at least two sides shall be considered a garage. So if it's not open on two sides, you know, then it's, if it's, if it's uh, even if it doesn't have a roll-up door, but you've got three walls, I mean, that's techni technically, uh, that's a garage. So in this example here, um, what are we trying to accomplish? I mean, technically, if we have to have a receptacle for each car space, then we would have to have one, two, three, four receptacles, two for the center and one for each single car garage in order to uh, accomplish uh, what the code's asking for in 21052G. And remember, we, we could not feed those outside coach lights or any other things on the outside off of those garage receptacles. Interesting. Okay, so that'll be a significant change if you're used to Installing outdoor lighting on the same circuit as the garage circuit. Uh, the, for the next section here, we're going to go to 310.15B7. Changes there. And uh, for that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Don Hersey. Okay, table 310.15B7, and you can see there by the photo, uh, it's in previous code cycles, but it's been deleted. It was permitted to be used to size service and main power feeders for dwelling units. Conductor sizes were based on the ampere rating of the service or feeder. This table has now been deleted. 
Uh, for example, this old table, that if you can see it through the red circle, if you had a 200 amp service, uh, typically 200 amp wire for table 310.15B16 with looking at 3 alt copper, whereas for a 200 amp dwelling unit service or a main power feeder, we can reduce that one size and use a 2 alt. The reason why is because there's a lot of diversity in residential uh, applications for use as the majority of your uh, major loads will not be on simultaneously like they may be in other than residential installations. This table has now been deleted as I said. So now the 2014 will permit the ampass to the service conductors to be no less than, and we've got a calculation involved, no less than 83 percent of the service rating. Also, the size of the feeder conductors that supply the entire load associated with the dwelling unit shall be permitted to have an ampasty not less than 83% of the feeder rating. As I said, it supplies the entire load. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a main power feeder. So we have the total diversity of that dwelling unit on that feeder, then we can use that same table as we can for the service conductors. 83% pretty much matches the conductor sizes that's allowed by the old table. So uh, pretty much everything will stay the same as far as the conductor sizes of the table, but now instead of using the table, we'll have an 83% uh, calculation for that. Four zero four dot two c the requirement for the grounding conductor being present at the switch location was first introduced in the previous code cycle, 2011. New conditions were added relaxing the requirement for a grounding conductor at a switch point. For example, where a switch does not serve a habitable room or a bathroom. For example, a hallway obviously is not a habitable room. So these are some conditions where this uh, grounding conductor would not have to be present at the switch, and we'll talk about it in a minute why that's required. Where multiple switch locations control the same lighting load such that the entire floor area of the room or space is visible from, from the single or combined switch locations would not be required. Where lighting in the area is controlled by automatic means, uh, it would not be required. And where a switch controls a receptacle load. If we have a switch control in a receptacle load, then uh, this uh, grounding conductor does, does not have to be present at the switch location. Now let's talk about why the code started requiring this grounding conductor to be present at the switch location. The reason for the requirement is to provide a grounding conductor for an electronic control device such as an occupancy sensor which needs a grounding conductor for the device to operate. Uh, the UL standard uh, allowed up to one half of a milliamp of current on the equipment grounding conductor. In previous code cycles, we were allowed to install these devices and that standby current, which is required for these to operate, would actually be connecting to the equipment grounding conductor, which may be a watt for 250.118, may be a wire, or it may be a metallic raceway or a metallic cable. And if we have several in this photo here, we have an office and we may have several uh, offices, uh, especially 277 volt, and we could put a lot of these on one 120 or 277 volt 20 amp circuit. And then if we have one of these uh, occupancy sensors in each room, it's additive because they're on the same circuit, so that half of a milliamp of current will be times ever how many rooms we have. So we don't, it's, not a, it's not a good thing to have current flow on equipment grounding conductors, regardless of whether they're wire or a metallic raceway or cable. So that's a, it's going to relax this a little bit uh, in the next code cycle. Uh, another location not considered a habitable room. It may be an attic or crawl space, uh, or maybe a switch controlling a, a piece of equipment, for example, like a garbage disposal. Obviously, we would not need a grounded switch. We would not need a grounded conductor at, this, at those switch points. Uh, thanks for that, Don. Um, I want you to know we're getting close to the hour here, but uh, stick with us. We've got only a few changes left to cover that are very important on receptacles, and replacement receptacles. So um, hang tight here. We'll get through the end uh, and entertain more questions. So, Jeff, um, over to you on the, the remaining few sections here. 
Okay, great. Section 406.4D, receptacle replacements. We have new requirements. And AF, basically AFCI type and GFCI type receptacles are now required to be installed in readily accessible locations for replacements. So, I mean, monthly testing, like Don mentioned, um, can be difficult if you can't reach the test and reset buttons on the device. So this will be interesting uh, for jurisdictions as well as homeowners or others that are just out there to do receptacle replacements. Um, you know, hopefully people are going to consider what locations are going to be readily accessible. It's unlikely that inspectors are going to come in and start you know, pointing out furniture layout. I mean, most furniture is movable. But in general, the, the intent here is to make sure that whenever you have a receptacle replacement, that if you're replacing it with an AFCI or GFCI type receptacle, that those uh, reset functions are readily accessible. So um, keep in mind also the 2011 requirements that become effective January 1 of 2014. So even for those who are still on the 2011 code and might not necessarily adopt the uh, 2014 code right away, um, 406.4 D4 says that where receptacle outlets are supplied by a branch circuit that requires AFCI protection as specified elsewhere in the code, a replacement receptacle at this outlet shall be one of the following. An OBC or an outlet branch circuit type AFCI, a receptacle protected by a listed outlet branch circuit type AFCI receptacle. So you can basically have one that's fed downstream of another that's protected by an outlet type branch uh, AFCI receptacle. Or a receptacle protected by a listed combination AFCI circuit breaker. So even for those who don't necessarily jump right in and, and get on board with the 2014, we still have requirements effective January 1, uh, 2014 that were specified in the 2011 code. Now, Don, didn't you have, uh, I think you had something here to add about receptacles and wet locations? Good cycle stated, but other than one and two family dwellings, the wiring for three or more apartments or anything non-residential, commercial, industrial application, an outlet box hood installed for the purpose should be listed and where installed on an enclosure supported from grade should be identified as extra duty. So if it's supported from grade, not installed on the building, but supported from grade, it had to be listed extra duty for other than one and two family dwelling. Extra duty covers are now required for all 15 and 20 ampere, 125 volt, and 250 volt receptacles that are installed in a wet location, and not just those that are supported from grade. This change will do away with the old in-use covers and should provide better protection for receptacles installed wet locations. We've all seen a lot of those in-use covers that were not extra duty listed, and they just cannot accept any physical abuse at all. And I've seen some cases, it seemed like a strong wind would disengage it and it would end up in the next door neighbor's yard or whatever. So now the code is going to require all of these that are in a wet location, uh, 15 and 20 amp, 125 and 250 volt, regardless of the location or, or the type of occupancy, that these outside covers will have to be listed extra duty. Okay, so section 422.5, GFCI protection. Um, we're in article 422 for appliances now. And the devices providing GFCI protection in Article 422 must be installed in a readily accessible location. So we're seeing that repeated throughout the code now. AFCI is readily accessible. GFCI is readily accessible. So even in Article 422 for the appliance itself, um, this is going to apply to anything governed out of Article 422. Drinking fountains, vending machines, tire inflation, auto vacuum machines, anything that can be considered an appliance. So that's just the same language we're going to keep seeing until we will get to a point where we can always reach our test and reset buttons of the device. Will the receptacle there in that photo have to be moved, Jeff? Um, I'm looking, I'm assuming we're talking about the receptacle that is behind what probably would be the refrigerator, possibly. I see a I see the receptacle behind the refrigerator. Um, <laughs> if that is chosen 
if, if that requires GFCI protection, and, and I mean it will um, in the kitchen. Well, I'm sorry, no, it will if it's within six feet of, of the sink. Um, you know, technically, if you're going to provide GFCI protection for that receptacle, it has to be readily accessible no matter where you put it. So if your home run circuit goes straight from the panel board to that point, and at that point branches off and feeds other receptacles in the kitchen for your 20 amp small appliance branch circuits, then yes, there would have to be a GFCI receptacle there, or you'd have to have a GFCI uh, breaker at the panel board. Thanks. Now, uh, we've reached our last, our final important code change, and for that I want to turn it over to David Burt, who will uh, wrap up this um, look at, a uh, first look at the important code changes in the 2014 cycle. Okay, this is 590.4J, and uh, it's about temporary wiring. And um, temporary wiring is when we're doing construction, maintenance, repair, remodeling, demolition, for installing holiday lighting for 90 days or less. Um, or if there's an emergency, uh, we could be installing temporary wiring. And, and this requirement here is, is basically to try to protect temporary wiring from physical damage. So. Uh, the requirement says that, that um, you know, when you have a branch circuit or a feeder wiring used for temporary wiring, it has to get up off the floor. Okay, so if we have, like, if we had receptacles, uh, then uh, anything plugged into a receptacle would have GFCI protection, but uh, GFCI protection for lighting uh, in a temporary situation is not required. So there's still dangers of shock hazard. Um, so we have to protect branch circuits and feeders used for temporary wiring, get them up off the floor, and protect them from physical damage. It does say in the section that um, if we had a, uh, a regular extension cord, you know, if we, were, if we had a piece of equipment over here in the soft horses and we were using an extension cord to power up that equipment, then that's okay. That, that can stay on the floor. Um, but anything that is a feeder or a branch circuit in a temporary installation has to be secured and supported and uh, up out of the way. 